we appear to be getting sicker. And uh, I wonder if you can outline the scale of what we have come to accept as normal. Childhood suicides are rising. Uh, autoimmune diseases are rising. Mental illness diagnoses are rising. Depression, anxiety, self-harming behaviors, cuttings, addictions. America last year had well over 100,000 people die of overdoses. 70% of adults are on one medication or another. Something's going on here, and this is considered normal. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Gabor Mate, nice to be stepping in the river with you today. Thank you. I look forward to the dip. <laughs> yes, we will try to harness the power of the river. Um, well, first and foremost, I, I just want to uh, offer my congratulations on uh, on your new piece de resistance, um, mm. The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Um, I know that this was a labor of love, of love for you, uh, with a significant gestation period. So, uh, well done. Thank you for this. Thank you so much. And uh, piece of resistance is a good way to put it, because it is an act of resistance. Um, <laughs> and, um, it's an act of pushback uh, in a what I hope will be a positive way against uh, a culture that is so abnormal that it's making us alien to ourselves. Yeah, and I, I want to define that abnormality. I mean, this book is, you know, I would categorize it as a profound excavation of the human condition. Mm. And um, it's uh, completely emblematic of your work um, in a broader sense in that it, it rigorously searches out root causes. Um, it, it's almost as if you're a system biologist <laughs> in your approach to our societal diseases um, in the sense that you're continually going upstream to identify mm -hmm. uh, the sources of our uh, myriad uh, pathologies. So. I just thought as a as an organizing principle for this conversation that you could slowly take us up uh, the river to better understand our afflictions and their sources and the context and, and hopefully find or bushwhack some sort of path towards healing. So uh, as a means of beginning, um, d despite our seeming societal obsession with wellness, uh, by every measure, we appear to be getting sicker. And uh, I wonder if you can outline the scale of what we have come to accept as normal with regards to chronic disease, illness, uh, and addiction, and how our social institutions are currently treating them. Yes. So, um, it really has to do with what you said about going up the stream to sources. The, as we speak, there's an article in this week's, I know we speak a few months ahead of publication date, but as we speak, there's an article in this week's New Yorker magazine by a very, very well-known American psychologist called, the, the online ver version is called uh, The Mysterious Rise in Childhood Suicides. Mm. And I tell you, the article reveals nothing about sources. And Childhood suicides are rising. Uh, autoimmune diseases are rising. Um, mental illness diagnoses are rising. Depression, anxiety, self-harming behaviors, cuttings, self-cutting addictions. America last year had well over 100,000 people die of overdoses. Um, in what is the world history's richest country, 70% of adults are on one medication or another. And so something's going on here. Um, and this is considered normal. And uh, my profession, the medical profession, treats each of these 
conditions as somehow separate individual, often unexplainable phenomena. So that not only, for example, does rheumatoid arthritis have symptoms, in my view, rheumatoid arthritis itself is a symptom of something deeper. Not only does depression have symptoms, depression itself is a symptom. In fact, it's rather tautological and, and absurd when you look at it. I've had depression, I know what it feels like. So Gabor has depression. How do we know that Gabor has depression? Because he feels discouraged and he's got low moods and he's um, sullen and withdrawn. Why is he sullen and withdrawn? Because he's got depression. How do we know he's got depression? Because he's sullen and withdrawn. Got, you know, it's, it's cyclical and it's nonsensical. <laughs> But what that comes from, what is the upstream cause of it, whether it's autoimmune disease, whether it's so-called mental illness, whether it's addiction, whether it's self-cutting, whether it's just anxiety, whether it's relational dysfunctions, whether it's alienation, the sources of it, modern medicine doesn't seek where it's to be found. It seeks it only in biology because we separate the mind from the body. So all of these conditions are considered to be just biological manifestations of some mysterious process. Once we understand that the mind and the body can't be separated in an individual, furthermore, that the individual mind and body are affected by the relationships of that individual to their family of origin, their work situation, their whole culture, and their whole society, then we understand what indigenous wisdom has always told us, that manifestations of individual, individual pathology, in fact, represents some problem in the whole commune, in the whole communal establishment of which that individual is a part of. Looked at from that perspective, as I point out in this book, there's nothing mysterious about why we're getting sicker, why more people are mentally ill and all that. It has to do with the nature of this very society and the stresses that it imposes on people from conception onward. So, yes, I'm looking upstream, and the problem with modern medicine is that it doesn't look upstream, or it looks upstream only in a very narrow biological sense. Right, and it... it and not to indict uh, allopathic Western medicine unduly, um, because clearly, as as you are quick to acknowledge, there have been some incredible innovations that have saved hundreds of millions of lives. But at this juncture, you know, we seem married to a paradigm that is focused on symptom treatment. Uh, instead of addressing root causes. So we're very, very good at writing scripts for whether it's statins for heart disease or SSRIs or antipsychotics for depression or, you know, you just kind of go down the line. And, you know, we've set up um, systems where um, like our health insurance industry, yeah, it's very quick to cover a $200,000 heart bypass surgery but it is not really going to cover or really support like people on the ground, like primary care physicians, and uh, and that's put people into this um, this paradigm of ten minute visits and just writing scripts and you know prescribing a pharmaceutical uh, and then moving on, and um, and that's obviously having a very deleterious impacts. Well, you mentioned. Uh SSRIs for depression, and you mentioned statins for high lipid levels and heart disease. Um, and, you know, I've taken antidepressants, and they've helped me. Um, I don't need them anymore. Um, but in principle, when they are necessary, they can be very beneficial. But if you look at both depression and lipids, they have everything to do with life stress and childhood yeah. trauma. So the more traumatized you are as a child, the higher your lipid levels are going to be as an adult. And uh, if you belong to a racial minority that's oppressed, your lipid levels are going to be even higher. Now, is that an individual biochemical problem? Or is it a social malaise? 
Well, clearly it's a social malaise that's manifesting an individual biological problem. Hmm. Black kids are six times more likely to die of asthma. Um, the biological aging measurements of black people, regardless of economic status, is more advanced than that of of, of, of Caucasians, regardless of economic status. And so that, that's just one particular example of a social force that manifests in human biology. And how it manifests in human biology is easy to show. We have the science to show it. So my beef against, my beef with the medical practices it's currently pursued is not that it's not scientific, but that it's not scientific enough. We ignore all the science that connects all these dots together. We ignore all the science I'm talking about thousands and thousands of research papers published in major journals that prove the, the unity of everything. Um, depression, that's fine. But you know something? For all the belief that depression is caused by low serotonin levels, you know how much evidence there is for that hypothesis? This circle with my thumb and, 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 and <laughs> forefinger, zero. That's zero scientific evidence. Hmm. Now, if you look at the word depression itself, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a giveaway. What does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. What gets pushed on in depression or emotions? Why would people push down their emotions? When these emotions are unbearable and they, they don't have support, when does that happen? It happens in childhood in response to all kinds of childhood circumstances from trauma to lesser degree of uh, misattunement. But when a child who has got this natural need to be able to experience all their emotions is either discouraged or especially forbidden from doing so, they will push these feelings down. They will depress them, not consciously, but automatically, unconsciously. Then they're diagnosed 30 years later with depression. Oh, you got this biological disease. You know, so whether we're talking about lipids, whether we're talking about depression or virtually any other chronic condition, it's upstream we have to look, and upstream meaning looking at the early conditions, the developmental conditions of children and, and human beings, and in the social context in which the development takes place. That's what it means to look upstream. Hmm. Yeah, you, there's a, a few... Um, quotes in the book there's one that i wanted to read if you're open to that um because and, i thought and, it's just... and i want to hear some of my own words quoted oh yeah okay sure good oh yeah well you're not a man that revels in ego adulation so you know i want to get how, your uh... Uh, how do you know <laughs> <laughs> i have a sense for you okay. um i'm trying to follow my intuition which is uh by extension following you we could begin to see illness itself, not as a cruel twist of fate or some nefarious mystery, but rather as an expected and therefore normal consequence of abnormal, unnatural circumstances, it would have revolutionary implications for how we approach everything health related. And I think, you know, what you're saying, and, and I've heard you say this in a different uh, turn of phrase, but that the, the ailments that we are experiencing en masse as a society is not a bug in the system. It's actually a feature of it. Yes. And, uh, you know, you present in the book quite a bit of clinical research um, around the uh, concomitants between or, or correlation between trauma and disease. So, you know, you mentioned depression, but for example, there seems to be a direct link between depression and breast cancer. Um, can you draw, like, a, create a little bridge between some of these um, conditions that we just would not instinctively expect? Well, so... Um... The New York Times uh, a couple of months ago now had an article uh, about this American physician who showed that women who are depressed, they're more likely to die of their breast cancer. 
big new discovery. We've only known this for 100 years. The New York Times just discovered it, you know? They, they showed the study. There was an American physician called Paget, P-A-G-E-T, who wrote about this in 1870, about how about the how about that 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 the link between depressed states and 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 emotional suffering and breast cancer is so obvious as to be impossible that it should be just a chance link. He said this in 1870 in a textbook of medicine that he wrote 150 years ago. Okay, that's how long we've. By the way, he wasn't the first one either. Galen, who was a Roman physician. Uh, second century, third century, I forget. He said the same thing. Now, we've had the science to show it now that the more stress there is, and depression is a stressed condition, the more likely breast cancer is. And particularly, not only me, but others, including people who have researched it, have shown that the repression of healthy emotions, particularly healthy anger, which is what depression represents. The repression of is a risk factor for malignancy. Hmm. Because the mind and body being inseparable, our immune system, or our emotional apparatus, and our nervous system, and our hormonal apparatus are not connected. They're the same thing. They're a unit. There are differentiated aspects of one organizational structure, one system. Now, take something like the repression of anger. Now, healthy anger has got a specific purpose. There's a reason why we have a capacity for healthy anger, and that's to protect our boundaries. You're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. Now, the role of our emotions is basically to keep out what's dangerous and unwelcome and to allow in what's nurturing and healthy and 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 welcome i'm going to give you a skill testing question if the role of the emotions is to keep out the keep out the unhealthy and to allow in the nurturing what's the role of the immune system the the role of the immune system is to keep out the unhealthy and to let in the nurturing that's what's the role of the emotional system the same thing no they're the same system they're the part of the same system. So therefore, when you're repressing one, guess what you're doing to the other? You're disabling the other. And it's really simple, both conceptually and physiologically, to show this. So therefore, the link between cancer in general and emotional repression is very obvious. In both cases, we're disabling our boundaries and our, and our self-protective mechanisms. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned healthy anger, um, and I suppose one might define that within the parentheses of, of of duration. So, healthy anger is is healthy in so far that it is short and in small doses. Um, that's an aspect of it. That's but that's not all there's to it. Not only is it short in duration, it's also appropriate to the situation mm -hmm. at present. You know, you know, there's a, remember the, um, oh God, the Three Stooges? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. So they have a routine called Niagara Falls where they're walking in the street and somebody says, inadvertently says Niagara Falls. And one of the Stooges turns around and says, Niagara Falls, you're the one that ruined my life, seduced my wife, wrecked my existence, you know. Totally absurd. Like Niagara Falls has nothing to do with it. So that's unhealthy anger. The trigger has got nothing to do with the, with the anger itself directly. So healthy anger is not only short in duration, it's also appropriate to the situation, to the present. It's in the present. It's not triggered by something in the past. So um, healthy anger says, you're in my space, get out. That's it. Once you leave my space, there's no more reason for the anger. Unhealthy anger is triggered by the past. And I talk about this, I give some examples of my own in, in this book, where some event in the present triggers me, but it's actually got nothing to do with the present. It has to do with some past wound that gets touched upon. And unhealthy anger, rather than expressing itself 
playing its role and then retreating, unhealthy anger gets bigger and bigger the more you give expression to it. So I don't know if, you, you, if you've ever had a rage episode, I've had my share. And what I notice is that I'm in a rage, expressing it doesn't make it better, it makes it worse. It, it recruits more and more brain circuits and gets more, no, that's also unhealthy. If, un, if the repression of healthy anger promotes autoimmune disease and malignancy, the unbridled expression of r- unhealthy rage uh, triggers uh, high blood pressure, strokes, and heart attacks. Yeah, and I suppose there you could make a parallel here with fear, you know, that fear actually can play a beneficial role um, because fear can be also understood as uh, respect or awe for something powerful. Um, and that is uh, uh, useful <laughs> from time to time. But perpetual, uncontrollable fear. Um, it has similar physiological downstream impacts as incessant uh, anger. And, you know, when you get into this kind of as it pertains to the relationship between our neurological systems and our our HPA axis, which uh, is very involved in the endocrine system and the secretion of various neurotransmitters, you know, we get into this kind of what I tend to call amygdala hijacked or or sympathetic overload, where we are in a constant cortisol infused state. And this is the really perplexing part for me, because we know the science is so clear around what happens when the body is in a constant cortisol infused states. You know, it, it degrades uh, it causes dysbiosis in the gut and leads to intestinal permeability, which then causes chronic inflammation. It it, it spikes, you know, blood sugar levels. Like we know all this stuff, but still, um, we don't seem to be able to acknowledge this very, very fundamental mind body connection. So, just as you say, fear is actually a necessary state. And in fact, there's a we have circuits in the brain to generate fear. So, if, if you know, if I'm sitting there eating my dinner and all of a sudden a saber toothed tiger lumbers into the scene, I better feel fear. Otherwise, I'll, I won't be eating dinner. I, I will be dinner, you know, very quickly. <laughs> so, that's healthy fear. That's in the just like healthy anger, it's in the present, and this response, it's it's an appropriate response to a threat. But on the other hand, if I were to believe that, take a far fetched but far from unknown example, if I believe that vaccinations are a plot by the Gates Foundation and the Clintons to introduce microchips into my circulation so as to control me. And I'm living in a state of fear constantly that these powerful forces are going to do terrible things to me. I'm going to be very stressed. And my stress hormones, just as you point out, will be circulating in high levels, which will have an effect on every system in my body. Now, by the way, between you and I, it's not that I would put it, put, put it past Gates or the Clintons to do something like that. It's just I don't think they got the capacity to do it just yet. You know, So I think we're safe for a while, folks. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, of course, but I'm, what I'm talking about is if you have that kind of chronic anxiety about anything, um, whether it's got an identifiable, identifiable cause or not, then your fear system and your amygdala, as you point out, is being triggered all the time. That has been shown to have an impact on the heart. There's a connection between amygdala overactivation and heart disease. And that pathway runs through the bone marrow and inflammatory substances and so on. But th- that inappropriate or inappropriate in the sense it doesn't belong here, that kind of fear under- undermines our health. And one of, the, one of the points I make about this society is it induces fear on so many people on so many levels. I mean, for sheer economic survival. I mean, here we have the richest society in the history of the world with untold resources. And how much... What, what, what large segments and growing segments of the population 
are having to live in fear of economic survival. Well, that has physiological impacts. That isn't just sort of an abstract um, concern. That affects your blood pressure and your lipids and your adrenaline levels and your intestines and everything else. Yeah. <clears throat> and when, you know, we begin to unpack the characteristics of what uh, comprises a toxic culture, you know, you, you don't have to look far. Um, you know, for example, you use that um, example of a, uh, Kind of uh, some of the conspiracy theories that have existed, you know, over the last years in in connection with COVID, and uh, you know, this is this kind of fear mongering is built in to our technology, uh, such that there is reward in sensationalizing and hyperbolizing uh, content, um, layering an editorial bias over it, and deploying it in a way that leverages human negativity bias, essentially, to trigger the amygdala uh, in the hopes of getting maximum, you know, clicks and likes and engagement to assuage our loneliness. You know, the, the whole thing is, um, yeah. it's vicious. Well, actually, um, actually, the example I gave, it wasn't fanciful. That was a conspiracy theory floated by a, a Florida pastor who's got hundreds of thousands of followers. And he's got a podcast and where he floats these theories. Now, and you're right, it builds an audience. It gives him a following. It also gives him power because people now look to him for solutions. Um, and having said that, I think he actually believes it. I don't think it's just a manipulation on his part. And I think it reflects his childhood trauma. I think at some point he probably experienced powerful people hurting him and controlling him. And he was helpless. So the, 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 the emotional template for the conspiracy theory uh, is genuine, but he doesn't want to confront that. He doesn't know how to deal with that. So in order to explain his paranoia, he has to generate some kind of phantasmagorical uh, explanation. But his fear is genuine based on his That's I don't know him personally, but I bet any odds that that's what I'm looking at here, knowing what I've seen elsewhere. Yeah, I think it would be helpful for your, for you to define your understanding of trauma because it was actually really clarifying for me because uh, I always conflate, I have, and I think many people are like me in terms of uh, that I conflate trauma with the distressing event itself but but can you untangle that a bit sure so um the simplest way to approach it is just to look at the greek origin of the word trauma which means a wound or wounding so trauma is not what happens to me trauma is what happens inside me as a result of what happens to me so trauma is not that i was hit in the head the trauma is the encephalopathy i deliver i i i, I sorry i i i um i develop as a result of the, the blow to the head. So the event is traumatic, but the trauma is what happens inside my own body. So the trauma is a psychological wound. Now, if you take the wound analogy, um, just look at how does a wound behave? Well, one way a wound behaves is very sensitive. So, you know, if you, the example I always give, Jeff, is if you tap yourself on the shoulder right now, why would you do it? Tap yourself on the shoulder. Okay, how much did I hurt? Not very much, well, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But imagine the same tap with your shoulder bare, and there was a there's a burn there with the top layers of the skin sloughed off, so your nerve endings were close to the surface. In other words, you were thin-skinned. Now, if you tap yourself with the same force, excruciating pain. So one aspect of trauma is that we have these sore areas when somebody touches them. It really hurts, and we react defensively. So I open the first chapter of the book with an example of some incident with my wife and I where I react like I was just being wounded, or I wasn't wounded at all, but it was a touching into some old wound. That was very yeah. sad. You know. Do, do you want to just um, 
expound on that a little bit? Because I, in the book, you also do, I think, a very eloquent job of uh, delineating between kind of capital T trauma yeah. And, yeah. and small T trauma, but really that this exists across a, a spectrum. So, yeah. 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 You want me to talk about that example? Yeah. So sure. what happens is, this is when I was young and stupid at age 72. I arrived home, <laughs> I arrived home from a speaking trip expecting to be met at the airport by my wife. And uh, when I land, I get a text saying, I haven't left home yet. Do you still want me to come? And my response is, never mind. And I go into a rage and I withdraw when I get home, having to ha having to undergo the unbearable indignity of taking a taxi home. Um, I won't even speak to her for a day until she says, knock it off already. You know, now what's that all about? Um, it's, it's, it's a rejection, abandonment response of a young child. That's how young kids re respond to abandonment, is when the mother comes back, they won't even look at them, and they're very angry at her. That happened to, right. me, that happened to me when I was a year old. I didn't, because of the circumstances, uh, the Jews living under the Nazis in Second World War, Hungary, in late 1944, my mother did leave me to a stranger, and I didn't see her for five weeks. When I did see her, I wouldn't look at her for several days. So that's the wound that hadn't healed yet. So then the woman on whom I'm relying to be there for me, all of a sudden says, and of course, what happens is my wife's a painter. And in fact, the painting of hers opens the first chapter. Um, and when she's in the studio, the world disappears. I, mean, I don't know if you're an artist, but artists know this. Like when they're doing their art, like there's no bladder, there's no belly, there's no husband, there's no spouse, there's only the process. They're in the flow, as a fellow Hungarian, Mihai, Chik Sant Mihai would have said. When she's in the flow, she doesn't look at the clock. I've only known this for 52 years by then. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's that, so it's, but that raw wound is still is sore. So that's one aspect of trauma. Another aspect of trauma, though, is wounds also develop scar tissue. Now, the scar tissue protects the wound and it pulls the tissues together, but it's hard. It is, it, it, it's not flexible. It's rigid. It um, can't grow. Um, it uh, doesn't have nerve endings in it, so it doesn't feel. And so, while trauma on the one hand is like a sore, raw wound that you touch it, it's just you get this reaction. But the other aspect of it is you don't feel, you don't grow, you're rigid, you're stereotypical in your responses. And those are the major aspects of trauma that that can be incurred by terrible things happening to you, like abuse, neglect, war, death of a parent. But it can also happen if you're a sensitive child, just by your, your needs not being met, not being seen, not being heard, not being attuned with, being disciplined, inappropriately, being talked to harshly, those accumulate and they can also wound you. And, and uh, that kind of wounding happens to a lot of people. So in a nutshell, you can wound human beings, particularly children, in two ways. One is by doing bad things to them, but the other is by not meeting their needs, their emotional needs. And in this society, the way we raise kids and the way parents are advised to raise kids tramples all over their developmental needs. I mean, we par our parenting is, I don't want to insult barbarians by saying that it's barbaric, um, but, 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 it, but it is, not in the sense of deliberately harsh and painful, but in the sense of unconsciously ignorant of what the child needs. And uh, a lot of children are getting hurt. Yeah, I mean, I grew up um, in the 70s and 80s and what was popular uh then and even into the 90s probably even now is this sort of like cry it out um theory for example uh where you know a baby will learn to be good uh if we just um let it cry it out but of course as you point out in the book i mean this um goes starkly in the face of a, a lot of indigenous traditions where where you know, I think in one example that you gave, the the, the children's feet don't even touch the ground for two years or yeah, something. You know I, that I, there I, is. Yeah, a Cree grandmother told me that. Um, well, yes, tell a mother cat to ignore the baby's crying. 
tell the mother orangutan to ignore the baby's crying. And yet, my mother did it. Uh, sounds like maybe your mother did. Um, mothers are still being told to do that by so-called sleep trainers. You know, now why do we have to train babies to sleep? Because their parents are stressed, they have to go in and go to work in the morning. Now, traditionally, I mean, through our evolution, the kids were with the parents for years and years and years. Here in the United States, a quarter of the women had to go back to work within two weeks of childbirth, which is a major abandonment of the as the child experiences it. But they don't do this for career reasons. They do it because for economic survival reasons. And a lot of middle class and upper class people are also advised, let the baby sleep, you know, let them cry it out. When the baby's crying, it's because they physiologically need contact with the parent. They need that. All young need that. When you, they don't get that, that's why they cry. Eventually, they give up. They go into a state of defensive shutdown, so they go back to sleep. Oh, you've succeeded. You've also taught him or her or them that their needs don't matter, that they're alone in this world. And uh, basically that the universe is indifferent. Yeah, it's interesting that we plant this seed around our concepts of justice, like uh, particularly retributive justice, mm -hmm. you know, early on where, and then this plays out, of course, like in the classroom where, you know, if you do something bad, you're sent into the corner with the dunce cap and you have to face the wall. <laughs> Essentially, you're isolated. Yes. And then, you know, play it out forward like the absolute harshest punishment that can be doled out short of capital punishment yes. is solitary confinement. And absolutely. Which, and, it, by the yeah. way, solitary confinement actually um, plays havoc with the brain with brain chemistry. You take uh, monkeys and you put them into solitary confinement, the number of their dopamine receptors go down. Dopamine is an essential brain chemical. Same thing happened to human beings. Then they come out and they behave dysfunctionally. Then you put them back into solitary. Now, with monkeys, when you put them into solitary and they come out and you put them into society, their dopamine receptors come back. Unless they're bullied, in which case they don't. So our brain is intricately intertwined with our social relationships. Now, there was an article just this morning in Science Daily that um, shows that pregnant mother's environments influence brain development before birth. And I talk about this in the book as well, but here's just one more study. Poverty, crime linked to differences in newborn's brains. Pregnant mother's environments influence brain development before birth. That's the study was, that was just published. That study adds to many more that have been published over the years. And, and, I, and I talk about some of them in the relevant chapter in, in the myth of normal. The result is your mother is deprived during pregnancy. As a result, you're punished by being sent to jail when you're an adult. And this is what we call our criminal justice system, which is a very good name for it. It's a criminal system. It's a criminal justice system. And it does not focus on on the harm that was done, right? And this is a whole other separate uh, diverging conversation that we could have sometime on the nature of restorative justice versus, versus retributive justice. Um, but uh, but for example, you know, you give this um, uh, this instance of you know the mother having to go back to work, you know, two weeks. Uh, after um, after giving birth, and you know we're forced uh, in this country to, uh, at least in the United States, to focus more attention on the economic needs of the mother versus the psycho emotional needs of the child. Yeah, yeah. And this is uh, seems like a misprioritization. Well, it's not misprioritization. If you're a company that's these low wage workers, it works beautifully for you then. Now, from a social point of view, 
it's going to cost a lot of money down the line in terms of education, um, um, rehabilitation, uh, juvenile delinquency, prison, lack of uh, productivity, crime, and so on. But you see, this is not a society that's based on long-term considerations. It's, 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 it's a social system that runs on short-term profit. And so from the point of view of short-term profit, it works. There you have this uh, poor um, segment of, uh, of the female working class that has to ignore their baby's needs in order to make a living at low wages. It works for somebody, Jeff, and that's the whole point. And, you know, it's not just a big mistake. That's why I say that these problems are not glitches or bugs in the system. They're features of the system. Hmm. Yeah, myopia is a symptom of, of toxic culture. And, uh, you know, obviously we're experiencing that on so many different fronts. The fact that we can have climate crisis literally not just staring us in the face but burning us down and really not modify behaviors or not feel any sort of um you know requirement for action and and it's it's astonishing you know and you know i look at covid for example and the marshalling of resources uh the bungling of resources as well, but you know, but the global um, ability to adapt behaviors, and on one level, it gives me a modicum of hope <laughs> because it, it does prove if we get motivated that uh, that we can do some things. But um, but it is also uh, you know that we continually act in kind of maladaptive short-term interest, which then, you know, you wonder why we have a $4 trillion, uh, you know, sick care industry in the United States is because we're just dealing with the aftermath of myopic decisions of, that are products of toxic culture. And it's the, like... The, the, myopic, the myopic, but at the same time, they're very cunning because, again... Every one of these decisions that from the human point of view are myopic or from the profit point of view, very beneficial. But it, I want to refer to what you said about COVID. It really, in the beginning, brought up the best in human beings. Um, first of all, whether you agree with the vaccines or whether you don't, there was a public health commitment to let's find a solution here. Not let's each of you individually find a solution. But let's, as a system, as a society, find a solution. Um, and if you recall those beautiful images of Italy, where people were, and it hit Italy first in a big way, and in, in, I should say in the Western world at least, people on their balconies playing music to each other and banging pots and pans in support of the healthcare workers. So the communality and the compassion and the cohesion that was manifest. And then as it went on, we got more and more alienated, we got more and more individualistic, we got we got separated from each other. But it showed you what was possible at least. If we actually to go back to what you said about climate change or take any other little bit debilitating social issues such as inequality or racism um, or the differential treatment of men and women, which results in a lot of pathology in women, by the way, as I point out. What, what if we applied the same commonality and cohesion and, and concern to, to all those crises, you know, as we did in the beginning, at least, uh, to the COVID threat? So it shows you what's possible if human beings are awake enough and inspired enough and, and motivated enough. But one of the features of this culture is it keeps us passive. Yes, we're, I think you call it hypnotic passivity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, well, you know, it's funny because if anything should underscore our mutual interdependence, it would be a viral pandemic, right? Because <laughs> literally, 
my well-being depends on yours. Um, and and you would, you address this, and this is of course a very kind of Buddhist notion on some level, and it's also echoed through many spiritual um, thought traditions. Mm-hmm. But that one of the delusions that is kind of the substrate of this toxic culture is this uh, our penchant for individualism and our inability to see that uh, we are so intricately, in, integrally interconnected. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to kind of the spiritual dimensions of this, you know, and, it, and, and how it kind of plays out from a disease and illness perspective in society. Well, to you begin by referring to Buddhism, so let's quote two Buddhist teachers, one the Buddha himself, who talked about what he called the interdependent core rising of phenomena. And he points out that a leaf or a raindrop are not separate phenomena because they contain the sun and the and the water and the earth, don't they? You know? And uh, he, he says everything is like that, that this is because that is, this is not because that is not. Interdependent core rising. The modern Buddhist teacher who just died in December, Thich Nhat Hanh, didn't say that we are, he said we inter are. He talked about interbeing, that was his phrase. Dan Siegel, uh, who's a Los Angeles-based psychiatrist and neuroscientist and mind researcher and very prolific author, talks about this concept of mui, that he calls mui, M-E and we combined into one phrase which is very much a theme. I didn't use that phrase in the book, but it's very much a theme. And he talks about the lie of the separate social, uh, the separate solo self, the lie of the separate solo self. And I quote him to that effect in the last paragraphs of, of, the, of the book. So now as soon as you go beyond the individual ego and, and you declare that actually we are part of something much greater, you get into what we may call the spiritual realm, which says that there's something beyond this particular confines of this individual body that we manifest and we're a part of and we're contribute to and we're contributed to and and that's just reality. Now, for some people, that takes certain mythical experiences or or spiritual pathways or, or, or... religious um, beliefs. Um, Others will get there through nature. Others will get there spontaneously somehow through intuition. Uh, But it's an aspect of human beings. And if you look at the native, the indigenous medicine wheel that um, encompasses our complete nature, they talk about the mind and the body and our social aspect and our spiritual and the spiritual realm. And that we are healthy and balanced only when these four quadrants of the wheel are balanced within us. And if you look at how we live our lives, um, it's much more emphasis on the body. The body is separated from the mind. We rarely think about the social as influencing those other two. And the spiritual is... We live in a very, for all the religion that's around, we live in a very secular society. And, and I don't mean that, I just mean secular in the sense of it, it, it ignores the spiritual aspect of human beings. We may pay lip service to it uh, on a Saturday in the synagogue or Sunday in the church or on Friday in the mosque, but we don't live our lives as if that was a reality. Yeah, and this interconnectedness can also be observed in the in the scientific and empirical realm, and not just through satori or, or numinous experience. I mean, you know, right now, you know, we are engaged with each other in the present moment. And there is a socio-genomic component to our connection and hopefully the connection that we're having with, with people that are listening and watching this that impacts 
our uh, our mutual um, neurology and by extension um, neurotransmitters and hormones that are pulsing through our body that impact our, our, our very gene expression. Um, and, uh, you know, you talk about this and this speaks directly to kind of transgenerational trauma, for example, is that, yeah, we have an underlying fixed nucleotide sequence known as the DNA, uh, but increasingly the DNA seems um, less and less important in terms of how essentially our genes express themselves, that there is this concept of essentially epigenetics, which can be understood as uh, kind of our genes expression in relationship to our environment, but that there is also a transgenerational component of this, is that if we, you know, suffer um, from an incident that, that, that propagates some form of trauma, um, that, you know, essentially our DNA can be methylated in, in particular ways um, to, uh, to, to damage gene expression. And that can be passed on to our children. So it's, yeah. It's a, um, I have to say that that's very exciting new research. And I do, of course, talk about it. It's significant. Um, what it speaks to is the larger issue that genes are turned on, on or off by the environment. So even two people with similar genes will have very different life experiences if they're exposed to different environments. And given that genes are the, the, the part of our makeup that we can't do anything about, how those genes are expressed, in other words, which, which environmental influences they're subjected to, that's the part we can do something about. So that's why it's so exciting and important to talk about the whole biopsychosocial environment. Now, as to the heritability of epigenetic influences, I think the questions are still very much open on that. There's been some interesting research, but it's that science is too new for us to really know what multi-generational um, impacts that will have just as yet. I think most of the trauma that we pass on isn't so much um, through genetic activity, even through epigenetics, as it is through the recreation of conditions from one generation to the next under the influence of trauma. But in terms of the heritability of, uh, of epigenetic influences, uh, Nematodes are worms, and it's been shown that, that you can pass on epigenetic influences for 17, uh, I think something like seven, 16 generations, because they have such short lives, you can actually study them. You can never do that in human beings. And so my son, Daniel, with whom I wrote the book, commented, we almost put this into the book, but we didn't. Of, imagine the headache of trying to organize a family reunion with 17 17 generations. <laughs> I, I can't do it with two. Yeah. Um, that line almost made it in the book, but we, I don't know if we cut it out for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's take a moment to to, uh, to talk about addiction because your work is so prolific in this regard. Um, and, uh, you know, addiction appears to be highest among the groups that have really suffered the most trauma and dislocation. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of mythology around addiction and public understanding of addiction. So I, I wonder if you can unwind some of that, particularly as it pertains to addiction, either being a choice or a disease or an outcome. Sure. Well, I can do that in two ways. One is just by talking about it, but the other is through um, a living example, if you're willing to be a living example yeah. at the moment. Sure. Um, and I have no idea how this will turn out, but I'm just going to give you my definition of addiction, then I'll ask you a question about it. So addiction, as I define it, and I think it's a complete and very clean definition, is manifested in any behavior that a person finds temporary relief or pleasure in and therefore craves, but then suffers negative consequences as a result of, and is unable to give up despite negative consequences. So craving pleasure relief in the short term, harm in the long term, inability to give it up. So my question is gonna be not, is, is have you ever had an addictive pattern in your life? And I'm not asking to what or when or how long, just according to that definition, is there some recognition in you that at some point or another in your life you've had some addictive uh, tendency? 
Okay. We're not gonna, we don't care when or what. All I'm going to ask you is this. Not what was wrong with it, which is self-evident. What was right about it? What did it give you in the short term that you wanted and appreciated? It gave me energy and confidence. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, start there. <laughs> and then, uh, no, is that a good thing or a bad thing in themselves? Energy and confidence. It's a very good thing. Yeah, it, it's part of our necessary way of being in the world. Have energy and some confidence in ourselves. No, in other words, the addiction wasn't your primary problem. It wasn't a disease. It wasn't a choice. It was an attempt to solve a problem. No, um, you don't see too many four months olds who lack energy or confidence. They own the world, you know. Um, so, so, so what happened along the way? <laughs> that's the whole point. Something happened. In other words, there's some traumatic traumatic imprint that robbed you of energy and confidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, then not having been given the proper help how to maintain those qualities, let alone how to get them back, you turn to something that gave you like an instant solution. That's not a disease. What kind of disease gives you energy and confidence? You know? Uh, uh, and did you choose to lack energy and confidence? I mean, do you wake up one morning and says, I'm going to lose my energy and confidence? You know? So the whole idea of choice or disease is nonsense. And so what it really is, addiction, whether it's to substances, and you know, I have two chapters on this in the book, and whether it's to substances or behaviors, whether it's sex, gambling, shopping, uh, eating, um, uh, pornography, uh, work. These are all attempts to solve a problem. Those problems represent traumatic imprints. And, and so rather than focusing on just trying to fix the behavior, we need to look at the fundamental traumatic imprint that's driving it. It's really straightforward. I'm not making this up. E e even the neurobiology of addiction, if you, look, if you look at the neurological needs of the child for certain brain chemicals, um, addictive behaviors give you the same brain chemicals that a child who's well-loved and well-attuned will automatically develop. So um, that's addictions in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, without delving into too much personal biography, I think you know, we, we may have talked about this once in the past, but in looking at it through this particular lens the, at this moment, you know, I was, uh, as a child, I um, was getting tugged around the world uh, with my parents moving from country to country, enrolled in a new school, every four or five months. I was also um, a pretty chubby kid and I had uh, dysplasia. So I wore like a little cork shoe, you know, one of those on the bottom of my shoe and kind of swung my hip around. And there I would be, you know, right. in You're a new right. school, in yeah. a new country, trying to learn a new language, um, essentially just trying to fit in or really belong but at that point fitting in was adequate and um and yeah i mean i became uh, I, I you know i just lacked confidence and i became at times very subdued let me let me interrupt here uh yeah do one of my interruption numbers okay um please uh were you ridiculed by other kids yeah yes yes how did you feel about that? Oh, I mean, I was ashamed. I was... Right. And yeah. this is the key question. Who did you talk to about how you felt? Oh, I, I don't think I did, really. Very good. Now, Jeff, do you have kids yourself? I do. Three. Okay. 
if at age four, five, six, they felt ashamed, alone, fearful, who would you want them to talk to? Me or their mother. Right. If you found out indirectly that your young child felt ashamed and alone and a fear, afraid and assaulted even, if you found this out indirectly, but, but they hadn't told you themselves, how would you explain that? Hmm. Well, I, I essentially, I don't know how it, I would explain it. I would assume that they just felt um, that, that they were more comfortable or it was somehow a, a successful formula for them well, yeah, to, re but, to but, repress it. But why would that be that way? The first day they were born and they felt uncomfortable, did they cry? Sure. What about the second day? Also on the second day. <laughs> Where would they have learned to keep it in? And why would they have learned that? Hmm. That's the trauma, Jeff. Yes. It's not just the ridiculous, not just the moving. It's that you were totally alone with it all. Hmm. That's the wound. Okay. Now, God love your parents. I'm sure they loved you. They did, they did their best. But something in them prevented A, from seeing your distress and B, made them behave in ways that gave you the message that they're not available to you. And that's the deep trauma that so many kids in this society experience. Certainly mine did when they were small because of the way I was then. And it had nothing to do with how much I loved them. Wow. Okay. Um... And imagine if you, and if you don't know, and you're probably not going to remember exactly how you felt, but imagine one of your children at age five, having some deep shame and deep fear and so on, and they can't talk to you. How do they feel? Yeah. I mean, yeah, they must feel very depressed or. Yeah. Alone. I mean, very alone. Yes. Very alone. Yeah. I mean, this is, um, yeah, this is really, I think, cutting really to the core of it because, like, I know that in your particular situation, you know, you were very married to your work, uh, as am I, mm -hmm. to, to the place that sometimes we would give that primacy over our own families. Yes. And a lot of that is because our culture sanctifies, you know, product and productivity and, and yeah. incessant work. And so we feel the need to fulfill a certain role. Um, I put it, within, I put, it, I put yeah. the other way on. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Actually, I'm yeah. not. Uh, uh, yeah. I put it differently. First, there's the need to be wanted and to be important that arises out of childhood experience. Then the culture takes that need and rewards it. Instead of saying, what are you doing, mm. you human person? You're ignoring your kids and you're putting success ahead of everything else. What are you doing? They say, hey, come on, give us more. The more you do, you'll be more revered doctor, more respected uh, in your profession, the more money you will make. So in other words, the culture rewards the traumatic responses to early experience. Right. Either yeah. it sends us to jail or it makes us into great successes. <laughs> well, this is, I think, a really fascinating part of the book uh, and your work in general is that, it, you know, that you point to these more insidious ways that we exhibit trauma mm -hmm. and then the knock-on impacts to that and, and how they are related to disease. So you know, maybe you can actually touch a little bit about on that of our, you know, you give examples around, uh, well, actually you draw, um, often I've seen you talk about this where you draw on obituaries, which I think is actually um, sort of a morbid but insightful um, technique. But, you know, you often talk about like our absolute obsession with duty and responsibility or, 
you know, people pleasing or our endless yeah. compulsion to look after the needs of others. Can you pull on that for a minute? Well, so um, I can I can be kind to you for two reasons. One is there's a genuine aspect of my compassion for human beings. But if I'm compulsively so, at the ignoring while I'm ignoring my own needs, then it doesn't just come out of kindness. It comes out of a need to be important and to be accepted and to be liked. Now, why do I have that need? Because I wasn't given them as a child. And so when you often, when you read obituaries, you read this obituaries that who, of people who die young, these extraordinarily nice people, and hundreds gathered to mourn how nice they were. They don't realize that that niceness happened at the expense of themselves and their own physiological health. So obituaries are often revealing of what we value as a society, and often what we value is... Um, is exactly what kills those people. So, one example I give you: this is a physician in Toronto or in Ottawa, Canada, who died of uh, cancer at age seventy-two. And uh, the obituary actually said, um, Sydney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, a bond that was apparent in all aspects of his life. As a married man with young children. Sydney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day, and then he would go home, greeted by yet another dinner to, to eat and, ju- and to enjoy, not wanting to hurt either, not wanting to disappoint either woman in his life. Sydney kept eating two dinners a day, two dinners a day for years until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. And this is presented as a wonderful example of a filial dutifulness. What it actually was was an it was this, a fatal belief that he was responsible for everybody feels and he was never disappoint anybody. So he could not say to his mom, "Hey, mom, I got news. I'm married and I got three kids, and I'm gonna have dinner with them most nights." And he could not say to his wife, saying, "Hey, Rosalind, um, you know what? My parents are aging. They need me. I need to spend time with them. So once or twice a week, I'm gonna have dinner with them." He couldn't do that. He tried to please everybody at his own. That takes a lot of repression of self. That repression of self has got physiological consequences. Or the other obituary by an appreciative husband, the woman who died age 50 or so of uh, of breast cancer. and, And the husband writes, she had no ego. She just blended and she never got angry with anybody. The worst she could say was fooey or something along those lines something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. And he's saying this appreciatively, not realizing that that repression of healthy anger and that desire to blend in with the environment at the expense of self is what killed his wife. So Richards are somehow sadly ironic that way. And I... I understand why people appreciate kindness and niceness, as we all should. The question is, what is the source of them? Is it genuine choice and compassion, or is it a compulsion to be accepted and to fit in and not to disappoint everybody? Because if it's a compulsion, it's going to exact a toll. And it fits, this is the characteristic studied over and over again in people who get autoimmune disease, by the way. Yeah. Which leads me to the next point, which is why do women have 80% of autoimmune disease? Because women are acculturated to be just in those ways under the patriarchal system. Yeah, I uh, I read that um, that data point. Well, first I'll remark, I, I think in light of that, my wife is going to live to about 200. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, good. But, uh, she, she's uh, anything if... Um, if not combative. Um, but, um, yeah, I read that data point uh, around, I think it was MS specifically, right? It's, it's, it's true about autoimmune disease in general. Rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus. Women have nine, chance, nine times greater chance than men of getting systemic lupus, for example. But MS, what's interesting is that the ratio of MS has been rising. So in the 1930s, it was, it was about equal. No, it's two and a half women for every man. And here you have the strict scientific 
self-evident fact that whatever's going on, it can't be genetic because genes don't change in a population over 70, 80 years, nor can it be the environment in a sense of diet or climate because that hasn't affected the one gender more than the other. I'm saying it has to do with the extra sex on women in modern society who are expected to continue their familiar roles of absorbing the family stress and being the caregivers like during COVID. There was an article in New York Times about women being society shock absorbers. They took on all the stresses of their families and they felt bad that they couldn't meet their husband's needs as much as they wanted to. Um, but at the same time, they have to go, go out there and make a living as well. Yeah, and, and of course, autoimmune diseases, it's essentially your own immune system going haywire and attacking your, yourself and triggering uh, an inflammatory response depending where it is in the body or in the nervous system, et cetera. And then, of course, what is the treatment for those yeah. uh, inflammatory diseases? Maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah, well, so this is another obvious point that sometimes you just wonder how come it doesn't strike every physician with glaring clarity. So some of the commonest medications that we use in all inflammatory conditions of the skin eczema or psoriasis, or the intestines in Crohn's or colitis, or of the brain, sometimes the nervous system, um, or of the joints, is steroids, particularly cortisol or derivatives of cortisol. And what is cortisol? As you pointed out, it's a hormone secreted by the adrenal gland in response to uh, messages from the brain, the hypothalamus, the pituitary uh, gland, which is the HPA axis that you mentioned earlier. So we treat everything with stress hormones, but we never ask ourselves, gosh, could this condition have something to do with stress maybe? And of course, when you do the research, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. So whether it's multiple sclerosis, lots of research, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lots of research, lupus, lots of research, um, you know, fibromyalgia, yeah. uh, well, endometriosis, whatever, what, what do you want to look at? All these inflammatory conditions have trauma and stress as their template. And then we go at these stress hormones in large quantities, but we don't say, well, hey, what about stress in your life? What happened to you as a child? How are you carrying yourself now? How do you feel about yourself as a human being? How is your relationship with your partner, spouse? What's your work like? What is your boss like? These questions that would illuminate every aspect of what triggers the illness, we never ask ourselves. We never ask the patients. And even when patients bring it up, doctors very often tend to dismiss it. Yeah, I mean, even if you look with COVID-19 and people are probably familiar with the cytokine storm, for example, yeah, yeah. which is a, like an over-agitated response of the immune system, essentially. And so, you know, we obviously associated COVID mortality, finally, with, you know, multiple comorbidities and, you know, but what's, again, behind all those comorbidities? Well, one of the answers could be stress. And well, of course, yeah. you know, we, we administered dexamethasone. That was like probably saved 100,000 lives as an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. A steroid. Well, and of course, when you look at who are most prone are the most stressed segments of society. People of color, people who are poor, people who are obese, but obesity itself is a sign of stress. Um, so I think... When the research is in, there's going to be a lot of similarity between some of the COVID manifestations and, and autoimmune diseases and for the similar reasons. Now, I don't want to put everything into one basket, but I, can, I think that makes a huge contribution. Um, and again, uh, these are the questions that doesn't occur to the average Western trained medical doctor to even raise, let alone to pursue. Uh, and yet, as I point in the book and as other people have shown in their work, when you ask those questions and people engage with them, that can make a significant difference to the course of any particular illness. Significant difference. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I know that there's starting to be little shifts. Um, you know, there's this new kind of holistic online um, health provider called Parsley, and I did their intake form. And it was like, 
it was like 20 pages long. I was like, they're asking me so many questions oh, about, um, and so, you know, there's little intimations of it, um, happening, but overwhelmingly, yeah. I mean, you know, um, I think anyone listening here who has gone to see any ologist of any sort, uh, can ask themselves that question, you know, have, were they queried about anything else in their life? Yes. Um, well, you know, in, um, in this book, I quoted a, th th let me just quote this if I may. This is a physician at Harvard University, revered physician at Harvard University, who says the following. He says, and this, and his, and his lecture, this is a lecture he gave to a graduating medical school class. He was a leading physician at Harvard. This, 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 this lecture was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Not, a, not some fly-by-night alternative organ, you know? But he said, social and psychic factors play a role in every disease, but in many conditions, they represent the dominant influences. And he added that mental factors represent this active force in the treatment of patients as chemical and physical agents. Now, he said this in 1938. This is published in the Journal of Medical Association. Eight years later, I'm talking to a leading physician at Harvard, and he says, to talk about the mind-body unity at Harvard is to risk your career. Hmm. This is a couple of years ago. And he says, it's changing a little bit now, but it's very tough. And the guy who said that was actually the head of a hospital unit at Harvard. His name is Jeff Rediger, and uh, he wrote this book called Cured, the... Um, life-changing science of spontaneous healing, where you looked at, who, what about these people that get better, even from terminal diseases, so-called, without medical help or after medical help has failed? What about them? And he found mostly, and I talked to Jeff, I, he found mostly that these people transform their relationship to themselves. And this is what Soma Weiss was talking about in 1938. But generations later you're still risking your career if you talk about it at harvard right well you often talk about the concept of alienation yeah um and uh, obviously one of those pieces is an alienation with yourself um but maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I, I i think you, you you bracket this topic so well okay so in fact, the essence of trauma is disconnection from the self, I would say. That's the essential wound. And I don't mean it's any kind of, it does happen in a spiritual sense, but it, it exists in a much more mundane, and by mundane I mean worldly um, dimension as well. So a, a child has two needs, or well, in this sense, the child has two needs. What is the need for, need for connection? Without that attachment, really, that's why babies cry, because they have a need to be held and connected with. They need that not just for to be fed and to be clothed and to be cleaned. They need it for emotional development. So we know what happens to kids who um, are physically cared for but are not held. They, they get sick and they may even die. So attachment, which is the drive to be close to somebody in order to be taken care of or to take care of the other, is basically an uh, essential and core human dynamic. And no infant could survive without that attachment drive. So that's one need. The other need is, we talked about this tangentially before, is authenticity which is basically means knowing what you feel and being able to express and act on what you feel. So being able to experience all one's emotions in essential, is an essential need of children. And why that is a survival need, let's go back to our saber-toothed tiger example. Uh, if you're out there and enjoying the sunshine and this saber-toothed tiger comes loping along, and you don't, you're not in touch with your gut feelings, and you, your mind goes to work, well, gee, uh, that's a beautiful animal, and uh, I wonder, is he friendly or is he hungry? Well, which is it, you know? You won't survive very much longer. 
So your gut feeling is fear. And your gut instinct is to protect yourself. That's essential. Not just in that extreme setting, but in any aspect of our existence. So we have these two needs, attachment, authenticity. Terrific. But what happens if your parents follow the advice of any number of behavior psychologists who teach them that an angry kid needs to be given a time out? So a child is angry because if you're doing your job as a parent, this is the example I always use, if you've got a two-year-old and they want a cookie before dinner, if you give them a cookie before dinner, you're not doing your job. Especially if you give them a second cookie. Now, what will a, what will a two-year-old do when they're frustrated? Well, they'll do what I've done as an adult very often as, when I was frustrated is to throw a tantrum. Nothing wrong with that. The child, that's just what the kid does. But if the parent follows the advice of the uh, behavioral psychologist and says, okay, well, time out. The message the child gets is, if I'm angry, I'm not loved. If I'm angry, I lose my attachment relationship. Therefore, the way for me to survive is to suppress my authentic emotion. So that's a trivial example. But there's many, many ways in which children in this society get the message that their authentic selves, as they experience themselves, is not acceptable to the adults. Well, now you have the, ch the child has this tragic dilemma, not on a conscious level. I can choose attachment, or I can choose, uh, I can choose mm -hmm. authenticity. But if I'm authentic, I, lose, I may lose my attachment relationship. Well, what do you think gets sacrificed only 100% of the time? is the authenticity, that connection to ourselves. And now we don't know who we are. And now then you get into this midlife crisis when you, even if, even if you've achieved success of a sort, as for example, happened with me, at some point you start realizing I'm not being myself. Who am I anyway? Well, who am I anyway was lost a long time ago when I had to make that unconscious but tragic choice between authenticity and attachment and it's so difficult for people to give up attachment even as adults even even people in bad situations and harmful relationships have a hard time giving up attachment because they're fighting to death of authenticity mm. Mm. so interesting and then of course if you don't authentically know who you are essentially if you're alienated from yourself then where is your identity anchored? Well, through the eyes of others yeah. or through what you have yeah. or through your role in society or the placard on your desk or, yeah. you know, through any one of these symbols. And of course, you know, this is, uh, this is the ego and attachment and identification with these kinds of things can, uh, you know, A, lead to a life of endless comparison, which is the thief of joy, put you on a hedonic treadmill uh, essentially where you know happiness is something that exists out there you know if only and only if i get that thing or am awarded this sort of thing or buy that mansion with the gargoyle statuary or whatever it happens to be yeah. um you know well then i'll be happy but then of course you know you achieve that and another shiny object appears on the horizon and, and we get stuck into this a hamster wheel of craving and well, this is uh yeah. the, the the guy who said it best is we quote him in the book you remember don draper from uh yeah sure madman yeah. Mad yeah the advertising executive he says happiness is something that you have temporarily until you need more happiness you know and uh <laughs> yeah. I, i'm not quoting him exactly but that was the essence of it and mm -hmm. um what he's talking about is the difference between happiness and contentment because contentment says, contentment says, I'm good, I have enough, I don't need more. Happiness is, this is good, I need more, you know? And uh, this whole society, uh, so much of the economy is based on people's desperation. That's why they, I mean, American, the American, that statement about the pursuit of happiness, I mean, think about that one for a minute. The pursuit of happiness, like it's out there and I have to chase after it. It is a pursuit. 
and a in an incessant pursuit, one that has no terminus. It's like yeah. it's like chasing the horizon. Yeah, or we're waiting for tomorrow to come. That's right. Um, yeah, it's um. So I, I want to shift our conversation a little bit towards healing. Um, and you know, how we can shift, um, our paradigm and, um, and, and build a, a new kind of substrate, uh, and a new context, um, as it appears that, you know, illness and disease and addiction are an outcome of the context and the substrate that we have. Um, so maybe you could take a moment um, and you, you know, you do this in the book to outline some of the essential needs of a child um, as part of a healthy development. And then, you know, we can get into sort of a broader um, definition of, of healing and what that actually means. Yeah. So a really good friend of mine, uh, Gordon Neufeld, who's a brilliant developmental psychologist, to my mind, uh, the leading developmental psychologist in the universe, lives here in Vancouver. Him and I wrote a book together. Um, but he, I turned to him and I said, what are the irreducible needs of kids? By irreducible, I mean, if they're not met, there'll be trouble as a consequence. And he said, first is an absolutely secure attachment relationship. Where a child is held and welcomed and celebrated just for who they are, not for what they do, not for how they look, not, a, not for how they behave, but just for existing. Number one. Number two, he says, within that relationship, rest from having to work to make the relationship work so that. Uh, the child is not there to meet the parent's needs, is not there to make the parent happy, um, is not there for the parent's enjoyment. She, he, they are just there. And they don't have to work to justify their existence. That's the second irreducible need, which has to be communicated in the parenting environment in the nurturing environment, which means wherever kids are nurtured at home, daycares and schools. Number three, what we already mentioned, is the fully developed capacity to experience all their emotions, grief, fear, joy, rage, whatever they are, without that threatening in any way the attachment relationship. The fourth is free play out in nature. Yeah. Now, play is incredibly important in the development of the brain. What Gordon is describing is precisely what hunter-gatherer groups always provided their kids. Free play out in nature, um, always around the adults. They were not hit. They were not, generally not punished. Um, and they became socialized, not because of stern admonishment, although they'd be told what's not acceptable, but because they lived in an environment where their full capacities could develop. And one of our innate capacities is for social coexistence. So, in many ways that we talk about in this book, and you and I already touched upon, those needs are trampled upon for so many kids. So then we lose connection with ourselves, which is the alienation that we've just talked about. It's also the essence of trauma is that disconnection from the self. And so healing then, the, the, again, if you look at the word origins, the, the prime origin of the word healing is for wholeness. So healing is not the same as cure. Cure is the getting rid of a disease. Healing is becoming whole again. In other words, 
reconnecting with self. And uh, in necessary, that's, that's very, very difficult, but it's entirely possible. So in the last, cha- last segment of the book, I think it's eight chapters, we talk about pathways to healing, the obstacles, the negative self-talk, the disconnection, the, uh, the belief that I have to justify my existence, um, the belief in my lack of worth, which is a almost universal traumatic imprint, imprint of doubting our, our own value because it was conditional rather than unconditional when we first were given our sense of value. So there are ways of recovering that connection, of becoming whole again. And again, as to quote Dan Siegel, who's very articulate on these matters, he talks about healing has to do with integration. And integration means both individuation and linkage. So healing doesn't mean that I just meld into the environment. It means that I become an, a genuine individual who is connected with the environment at the same time. So healing is integration. Integration of all of our own parts, not rejecting any aspect of ourselves, not rejecting our hate, not rejecting, but understanding it, uh, not rejecting our, um, even our self-loathing, we don't reject it. Because any part of us, whether it's self-loathing or whatever it was, came along for a reason at some point. And without going into detail here, I do point out that every aspect of our emotional makeup originally came along for a reason. So therefore, we don't reject any part of ourselves. We understand them. We get to know them. And we let go of them when they're no longer serving their function. Now, that's very easy to say in a few words. It's, as I know and as I imagine you know, it's extraordinarily difficult, but it's doable. So the end end result is integration of the self, within the self, an integration of that self within that larger self with the capital S, uh, recognizing that unity. That's healing. And it's a lifelong process, at least for me it is. Yeah, I'm really glad that you uh, underscore it as a process. Um, Because, you know, when you talk about illness, on the other side of the equation, you know, you you make this clear in the book that illness is not an entity that one can have. It is a part of a process. It is a certain kind of uh, dysbiosis or imbalance, if you will. And that healing is not necessarily a a cure-all. It is also a pathway it's a process to wholeness. I think, you know, Patanjali um, described moksha or meditation um, as the progressive quiety, quieting of the fluctuations of the mind. He didn't say the cessation of the fluctuations. <laughs> he said the progressive quieting. And that, that becoming whole is a practice and a process um and of course you know this speaks to our very very nature as impermanent as essentially a process and um uh i think this is really helpful for people um because there's like this pressure Mm -hmm. to be healed (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. um, and uh, I'm not sure it's something that you hold in the palm of your hand, um, you know, like a phone. Well, process is the uh, key word here, and and uh, it's it, you know the language is so decisive in shaping our our point of view. So when you say like you 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 talked about this, when you say I have a disease, there's an assumption there. Like I have a cell phone. Here's my cell phone is distinct from me. I can put it down, I can destroy it, I can sell it, I can lose it, I can buy another one, but it's not me. To say that I have a disease, like so I've been diagnosed with ADHD and depression, to say that I have have ADHD, or I have multiple sclerosis, 
or I have anything, is to assume that there's this thing that I have that's distinct from me. Well, that's a certain way of thinking about it. But it's not necessarily reality. It's much more true to say that the ADHD is a manifestation of my life experience. That at some point, tuning out was a defense mechanism I had to employ because life was just too stressful at some decisive point. Um, to say that I have multiple sclerosis um, is to assume that the disease have a life of its own. But I know so many cases who once people understand all the research that's been done around multiple sclerosis. By the way, as one example, the, the person who first described multiple sclerosis was a French neurologist. He's considered the father of modern neurology, Jean-Marie Charcot. And he said, it's the result of vexation and grief. Now, that, well, that was in the 1800s sometimes. Since then, there's only been oodles of research, just tons of research, showing the relationship between childhood trauma, adult stress, relationship issues, and so on and so on, and the onset of multiple sclerosis. But the average person, when they go to the average neurologist, they're never asked about any of that stuff. And yet, if they understand that this disease doesn't have a life of its own, didn't strike them mysteriously, but is a manifestation of their lives, including their traumas, and if they realize it's a process that they have some agency over, that changes the whole trajectory of the so-called disease. And I know many such examples. So in other words, the, the, the question of, is disease a process as a manifestation of a life, as opposed to this entity with a life of its own, is not just a theoretical question. It's a very practical one when it comes to the healing process itself. And it's also a much more optimistic and positive uh, outlook. It's also much more scientific. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, you speak to possibility and optimism and I, and I suppose really compassion mm -hmm. as a central component to being the agent in your own healing. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, w without giving away too much, um, you know, gold pieces uh, here from the book, you know, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about compassion in general as integral to the process of healing. Well, um, I quote Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, who's a great Russian playwright, but he's also a physician, actually. And uh, mm. he talks about compassion as the healing agent. Again, I'm not quoting him verbatim, but he, he did talk about it in that way. And um, because as another teacher of mine said, only when compassion is present will people allow themselves to see the truth. So if people can look at their own lives, not with judgment, but with compassion. So, not why did I become an addict? But, hmm, why did I become an addict? You know, the same question, but phrased in a different tone. That's got completely different implications. Because the first is the self-accusation. You'll never find the answer that way. But if you ask, huh, what, what, why did I? What, what happened here? Well, then the inquiry that you and I engaged in briefly about addiction, about what it did for you and, and what were the source of it, will then naturally open up. And once that inquiry opens up, healing becomes possible. So self-compassion is essential for healing and self-compassion simply means not being stuck in judgments about the self, noticing the judgments that arise, not judging yourself for having judgments, by the way, either, because those judgments also play their role at some point, but in just noticing them, and this is a very Buddhist thing to do, you just notice whatever arises, and you just accept that it's there, oh, there's self-judgment here now. Not, I shouldn't have self-judgment, but oh, there's self-judgment. Hmm, wonder that's a, what's that about? So staying endlessly curious, that's what I call compassionate inquiry. And uh, that self-compassion will open up the pathways to healing. When it comes to the promoting the healing of others, I distinguish these five levels of compassion without perhaps laying them out now. But 
that's what's necessary is, is, is you know, if, if I'm going to bring healing to others, not cure, but healing, a cure may follow. But if I'm going to bring healing to others or encourage their own healing process, encourage their own self-compassion, I need to be compassionate. And unfortunately, when you do studies on medical students, their highest level of compassion is measured just before they start their training. Because they're treated so harshly themselves, they lose the patience and the compassion for others. Yeah, that is disturbing given the Hippocratic Oath. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, this notion of compassion as identifying the suffering of another as one's own, you know, kind of as in the sense of karuna, if you will. Um, this has been very, very core um, to my own journey. And, I, and, I, and I've seen compassion kind of as a, uh, as a process too, where you can identify uh, another's compassion or, or another's suffering as your own and then you can work to bring love and kindness to the presence of suffering in a manner that alleviates it. Um, and, and that is a further um, uh, indication, I suppose, of growth. Yes. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and then the framework, the therapeutic framework that I developed, which, which is called Compassion Inquiry, we even notice the lack of self-compassion when it shows up. And we respond to that compassionately, you know? So um, it, 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 it is all about being fearlessly compassionate in the face of everything. Um, and and that's this, we all have the capacity to heal. We all have the capacity to heal and, and even through, not even through, sometimes especially through severe illness. People actually discover the healing path. And so there's a chapter called Disease as a Teacher. Now, it's not, I don't recommend disease as a way of learning anything, for God's sakes. I don't recommend it. All I'm saying, I'm just reporting that a lot of people have seen the illness as a wake up call, how they've lost connection to themselves and that they must regain it. And uh, so many people, even in the face of severe illness, life-threatening illness, again, I don't recommend this, I don't advocate it, but they've said to me, I'm grateful for this illness because it taught me to reconnect with myself. I don't, yeah. I don't want to find out how I would do in the face of that. Yeah. So again, I'm not romanticizing anything. I'm just saying that's how it has often worked in my experience. Yeah, I know that we've both spoken extensively with Anita Morjani, for example, who had a near-death experience. Now, this is an example in extremis um, in terms of refinding yourself um, by essentially uh, observing the white light of the other side. Um, but I can even speak from my own personal experience. When I was 13 years old, I had a tumor um, and was admitted to Sloan Kettering Pediatrics Ward. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Pediatrics Ward at Sloan Kettering is not an upbeat environment. Um, it, it doesn't, it, let's just say the indoor is wider than the outdoor um, for, for pediatrics uh, in a cancer ward. And um, boy, was I a different human being uh, getting wheeled out um, of that ward as a, as a 13 year old. And I, I often mark that as the inflection point of, you know, I suppose this sounds a little trite, but of, you know, becoming a man. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, uh, it happened at the same age as the Jewish Bar Mitzvah. The, uh, <laughs> that's the, right, the, it did. The, the initiation into the adult world. Huh. Yeah, you're right. Were you able to appreciate that at the time, Jeff, or did that just come to you later? No, I did actually really appreciate it at the time or, or shortly thereafter. And it was odd because it created a little bit of a um, chasm between me and my friend group at that juncture because I came out and I had a... I imagine it would have, yeah. Yeah. 
I had a rehabilitation period at home yeah. and then all of a sudden kind of what seemed interesting to me and what seemed interesting to my friends were, were no longer yeah. uh, part of the same Venn diagram. Yeah. Um, I get that. But, um, but yeah, I want to just in closure, you know, just read one more quote that struck me. Um, I have it here. If we treat trauma as an external event, something that happens to or around us, then it becomes a piece of history we can never dislodge. If, on the other hand, trauma was, is what took place inside us as a result of what happened, in the sense of wounding or disconnection, then healing and reconnection become tangible possibilities. And this is what I really left the book with, you know, despite the litany of of maladies and all that we can point at that is gross in the world and toxic, as you say, there is this possibility, there is this wonder and awe. And uh, I mean, and you you accentuate this towards the end that there is a door that we can keep open yeah. both as individual people and as uh, and as a society and i thought that was just uh, beautiful well thank you and i really um i think you summed it up so well i have nothing to add to that really it's just that possibility is with us uh, as long as we have consciousness and uh if trauma is what happened to us, if my trauma was that my grandparents were killed in Auschwitz and, and that I was separated from my mother, and that will never not have happened. But if trauma was what happened inside me as a result, which is the disconnection from myself, well, that possibility of connection existed every moment in the present. So that view of understanding trauma is not only more accurate, but it's also far more um redolent with healing possibility mm. so thanks mm. for quoting that yeah well gabor thank you i'm so grateful for this time um but moreover i'm just uh, grateful for your commitment and your body of work it's really just on a personal level really helped me to better connect with myself um to launch my own path of healing uh and to really grow as a, as a human being and um there's this concept called sonder <laughs> um it just popped into my head just now um which is sort of a recognition that we are all on a journey and um and it's the, the recognition of someone else's journey and uh the way that you convey your message the way that you are humble and conduct yourself through the world um it inspires a lot of sonder in me um would you define and, that word uh, is, it a, is it a sanskrit word a sanskrit word what is it no it's a you know Sanger. i don't know Sanger. actually it just popped into my head as i was i had no i had no note on it <laughs> i think it's s-o-n-d-e-r um it's just a, a word I picked up along the way. Well, I, I, I kind of get the meaning without understanding the word. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to, to leave people is yeah. uh, on a note of learning. Yeah. So go look it up. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, listen, I so appreciate the time you spend. I really appreciate how carefully uh, you've read the book and how you um, structured into you because, you know, it, it took 10 years of a lot of work, um, a lot of self-doubt, and uh, to have it read and appreciated and understood, it means a lot to me. So thank you. Hmm. Yeah, well, like I said before we started, um, I only had the opportunity to get once through, and but I absolutely guarantee that this is going to be the first of many. The book is that rich. And... Um, if your prior books are in any in indication of the influence they've had on helping scores of people around the world, um, 
boy, I know this one is. And uh, I'll do everything I can to uh, to make sure that that message gets out there far and wide. So well, thank you. Much, lo- much love to you, my friend. You too. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.